So good morning, everybody. Uh, um, my name is Hui, and I'm glad to coordinate this series on environmental and human health risk assessment of the IS series this uh, uh, semester. Um, so um, we uh, has gone through the second uh, uh, sections of the uh, series, and uh, we have gone through um, the risk from water. Uh, mitigations from um, occupational uh, risk uh, for health, uh, notably for cancer. We have gone through earthquake risk and then landslide risk as well. And then today, uh, uh, I'm glad to introduce to you Professor Matthew Hill from the University of Edinburgh to talk to us about quantifying the health risk from air pollution, which is another element um, uh, of pollution that we may have. Um, so uh, first, let me introduce Professor uh, Matthew Hugh first. Uh, so he's a professor of atmospheric chemistry at the University of Edinburgh in the UK. And um, uh, prior to that, he uh, was graduated for his bachelor degrees from the University of Cambridge and a PhD from the University of Oxford, so own prestigious university in the UK. Um, and um, and let me talk to you a little bit about, about his research interests. So he uh, worked on the combinations of field measurement and modeling to be able to deal with uh, um, uh, different uh, questions and majorly um, the, uh, the composition of the atmosphere and the exchange between the atmosphere and the surface in terms of fluxes. So he works as well uh, and uh, it is a topic he's going to talk to us today. It's about air pollution as a con consequential impact of on the environment and human health. And um, I just quickly uh, gone through his uh, publication record and he's uh, acquired important numbers of 134 publications he's authored and all his work has received more than um, 4,000 citations, which is very uh, important to say. So I'm not gonna uh, hold more time. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from Professor Hugh and then I just turn the stage to you, Professor Hugh. And many thanks again for uh, accepting doing these lectures to us. Okay, let me just see if I can get my PowerPoint up. Yep. And can you see that? Yeah, we see you very oh. well. Perfect. Thank Ex you very much. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction and hello to everyone, whichever time zone you're in. So, uh, as the title of my lecture for the next uh, 45 minutes or so implies, I'm going to explore or how one assesses uh, there is a risk from air pollution, how one quantifies that risk, and uh, at the end, uh, a few words about how one tries to communicate that risk uh, to the general population. So I'm going to start by looking at some of the headline numbers associated with the health risks from air pollution. And I'm going to begin with this graph here, which comes from the World Health Organization, who periodically undertake what's known as a global burden of disease assessment where they try and estimate the number of deaths associated with different risk factors and this is the uh, burden associated with the risk factor to do with ambient air pollution in particular in the form of particular matter pm 2.5 and as we can see from the right hand bar chart which represents the year 2015 they're estimating that globally there's more than four million premature deaths per annum around the world due to air pollution and the different colors in this bar represent mortality due to different diseases for example low respiratory infections cerebrovascular disease ischemic heart disease and so on if we look at where air pollution as a risk factor lies in a ranked list by these world health organization as shown here on the right we can see that actually overall air pollution is reckoned to be the fifth most important risk for mortality around the world and the most important environmental risk we can see there in the right hand column that the highest risk is high blood pressure, but there are other factors like high cholesterol uh, and also things like smoking. But down there in the fifth place is air pollution and it's the highest placed environmental risk factor. The Global Burden of Disease Project also uh, presents these data in another way, which is the percentage of deaths attributable to air pollution. So I've got maps that re represent this statistic for PM 2.5, at the top map and ozone in the bottom map colored according to the percentage of deaths that they attribute to these two air pollutants and if we look at the bottom map we can see that the range varies from just a, a few few percent or less than less than one percent up to uh, around two or three percent but for pm 2.5 this percentage values start from just a few percent but go up to about eight percent so we can see that pm 2.5 in general is perceived to have a greater health burden than ozone so this is just another way of expressing 
the health burden associated with air pollution. If we focus in a bit on something more local to where I live in the Euro European Union, we've got some data here from the European Environment Agency. And the top table here tells us what proportion of the population within Europe is living in an area that exceeds certain guidelines for air pollutants. On the left hand side, we've got the percentage of populations living in areas that exceed the uh, EU limit values, for example, for PM 2.5 here, six to eight percent of the population. But if we look at comparing the pollution where people live against the WHO, the World Health Organization air quality guideline, which is a lower value for PM 2.5 of 10 micrograms per cubic meter, we can see that the proportion of people that are living in uh, areas that exceed that value jumps up to 70 to 80 percent and it's a similar story for ozone against the eu standard it's it's a few tens of percent by the time we look at comparing against the who air quality guideline it's almost 100 percent what does that translate into in terms of premature deaths for Europe. Again, it's staggeringly large numbers, PM 2.5 over 400,000 across Europe, nitrogen dioxide, 79,000, ozone, uh, almost 18,000. But at least within Europe, the air pollution is going down. And we can see that in this trend graph here, which is the estimates of the total premature deaths due to particulate matter in Europe over the last 25 years or so. And over that 25 year period, it's estimated that the attributable deaths have gone down by a factor of two. Zooming in uh, even more locally, from my perspective, uh, in the United Kingdom, we've had a couple of authoritative reports over the last few years estimating the deaths in the UK associated with air pollution. On the Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollutants estimated about 29,000 deaths annually, and a report by the Royal College of Physicians estimated about 40,000 deaths. Annual. So these are these are fairly substantial numbers that we're talking about. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to try and dissect how do we determine and quantify the risk from air pollution? What does an attributable fraction of mortality or indeed a hospital admission mean? How do we assign numbers of deaths to air pollution? And who individually is actually being affected by air pollution and by how much? And I'll end by a few words about communicating uh, these numbers associated with air pollution. So let's start with the first of these. How do we quantify a hazard and a risk from air pollution? Well, we could look at some occupational studies where we may have some specific individuals that by um, nature of the work that they're doing uh, may be exposed to some of these uh, air pollutants and look to the effects of those people but the issue there is that we've only got a very small number of people usually and that their exposures are often higher sometimes quite a bit higher than out there in the outdoor air which is what we really want to know about we could also do some controlled exposure studies but clearly that has major ethical constraints where we were putting people or animals into chambers and exposing them to air pollution and effectively waiting to for them to get ill or to die we really can't do that so that's clearly a very very limited uh, range of experiments that can be done uh, on, on actual human life subjects we can also only do that for revealing some acute effects so short bursts of ozone for example or nitrogen dioxide so that means that overall if we're wanting to quantify you know, the true population level response to ambient air pollution we need to resort to epidemiological studies so these are essentially observational studies, they're statistical studies, they're looking at data associated with exposure, data associated with health outcomes, and trying to look for the correlation and the regression between them. So at the outset, it's a very, very simple approach. As I say, we are looking at populations, we're looking at the exposure that people have in those populations, and we're looking at the health outcomes on a population basis. And under a simple, perhaps ideal scenario, we might get something that looks like this and that gradient is our risk assessment the more exposure you have the more adverse health outcome you've got so i'm going to come back to epidemiological studies in a moment but i'm just going to take a a, a short break to look at air pollution in, in general try to understand uh, the health effects of air pollution is rather difficult because air pollution oh i'm sorry let me just go back and ideal scenarios we might get a linear relationship that looks like this. In reality, the relationship between exposure and health outcome may look like that, it's like curvature. Or we might have a relationship that looks a bit like that, 
where we have a linear relationship between exposure and health outcome, but we have an intercept on the x-axis. And that's telling us that there may be evidence of a threshold concentration, i.e. a concentration below which there's no discernible effect. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So my apologies for skipping that. What I'm going to do now is look at the individual uh, air pollutants that are causing these adverse health effects. So there are plenty of these epidemiological studies being done around the world, and a lot of literature on them now. So what happens is that there are expert groups get assembled by various organizations, for example, the US EPA or the European Union or the UK or the W Health Organization. They look at all this literature and they try to come to an understanding about what it's telling us about the risks associated with air pollution and various very authoritative reports get published associated with that. And the list of pollutants that, that typically come up with as having uh, widespread potential or actual health impacts is this list as shown here. So there are pollutants such as benzene, 1,3-butadiene and benzoapyrene, so specific organic pollutants. Also some specific heavy metals, some usual suspects there, lead, mercury, cadmium, nickel, arsenic. And these generally have long-term effects, for example, carcinogenic effects or various neural or, or toxicological effects. But in general, in terms of population exposure, these really aren't that important. They, they may only be important to certain people who live close to certain sources. Then we have uh, some of the inorganic gases like sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone. And these generally have health associations associated with respiratory effects. Uh, lung function and that sort of thing and for sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide it's generally short-term effects short-term exposures are important when we move to nitrogen dioxide and ozone it's both short-term and long-term effects that might be important and when we get to particulate matter then there's studies indicating a very wide range of health effects associated with particulate matter, respiratory effects, cardiovascular effects, neural effects, pregnancy outcomes, and so on. And if we were to look at the health burden globally, then it's these last three, PM2.5, particulate matter, ozone, and nitrogen dioxide, which have by far the greatest health burden in a, in a population context. Trying to unravel the actual risks associated with an individual air pollutant is quite complicated because air pollution is a complex mixture derived from lots of different sources. So I've got a little cartoon here that indicates that we've got emissions of gases, emissions of particles from a wide range of sources, industrial sources, transport sources, agricultural sources, also some natural sources. And those emissions may be uh, close to the receptor, they may be a long way to the receptor, they get emitted into the atmosphere. And there's a lot of chemistry going on in the atmosphere. There's a lot of transport associations with the meteorology. So that when we get to trying to unravel what people are exposed to at the end, they're exposed to a very complicated mixture of both primary pollutants, those are emitted as pollutants, and secondary pollutants. These are the ones that are created from reactions within the atmosphere from other pollutants that are emitted as primary pollutants. And an individual may have different mixtures of primary and secondary gases and particles in what they're inhaled in one location compared to another location. Another cartoon to represent the complexity of what's going on is, is illustrated in the bottom here, where we might represent that somebody living in an urban area is exposed to a certain level of air pollution, and that's composed of both so-called regional pollution that's been brought into the urban area, into the city from outside the city, then a general urban increment, this hump in the blue that represents the sort of integration of all the sources within the city and then on top of that some very localized sources as well for example distance from a busy urban road so it's a complicated story and if we look at some of the uh, issues with the specific pollutants that are of major concern like nitrogen dioxide nitrogen dioxide is is essentially a, a primary pollutant its source is dominated by combustion sources, not necessarily fossil fuel combustion, but also um, biomass combustion, particularly from transport sources and domestic sources, domestic heating and domestic uh, cooking sources, particularly where that might be solid fuel burning. It has a relatively short lifetime in the atmosphere as well, typically a few hours to a few days. So that means that if we're looking at people's exposures, the pattern, the spatial pattern of people's exposures, we can pick up 
the sources quite clearly. So I don't know whether you could discern that. That's a map of the United Kingdom we've got there, uh, superimposed upon which you know, the nitrogen dioxide concentrations and the redder the nitrogen dioxide concentration, the, the, the higher the NO2. And for those familiar with the geography of UK, this is the London area here. We've got Birmingham here. We've got other major cities here. Up here is Edinburgh, where I am here. But we can clearly point out the spatial heterogeneity because of this relatively short lifetime associated with nitrogen dioxide. Ozone is completely different. It's completely a secondary pollutant. Ozone is not emitted as ozone. It's formed in chemical reactions in the atmosphere. And I'm not going to go through any of this chemistry in detail, but just to illustrate that it is quite complicated. It depends on emissions of VOCs and NOx emissions, but it also depends a lot on the meteorology, on the land surface in terms of deposition of ozone. And the point here is that uh, these processes are working on very different time scales and therefore spatial scales that may represent may vary from a few minutes to a few hours up to annual time scales. So it's a very complicated issue trying to unravel people's exposure to ozone. If that isn't enough, when we move to particulate matter, it becomes even more complex because particles uh, are not a single entity like a gas molecule. A molecule of ozone is a molecule of ozone wherever and however it is formed, whereas one particle is not necessarily the same of another particle. Particles in the atmosphere come in a wide variation in, in size and shape and in chemical composition. And this graph at the top of the picture here illustrates the wide variability that there is in particle size in the atmosphere. And the scale on the x-axis there is varying from several microns 10 microns in scale at the right hand end through one micron down to just tens of nanometers. So if we go out into the atmosphere and, and measure the particle size distribution, it's typically in this sort of trimodal shape here. We have some coarse particles of a few microns in size. Then we have the so-called accumulation mode of a few hundred nanometers in particle diameter. And then the Aitken and nucleation modes, which are the fresh particles of just a few tens of nanometers in diameter. So a very, very wide range in particle size. In terms of the quantification of particles for risk assessment, we, we generally quantify them in these two fractions known as PM10 and PM2.5. And that means all the particle mass within the particles of less than 10 microns in diameter or all the particle mass of all the particles less than two and a half microns in diameter. So essentially PM2.5 or PM10 are just separating out the coarse particles on including or not including the coarse particles. In terms of chemical composition, as I say, uh, particles can vary enormously in their chem chemical composition. This figure at the bottom of the diagram illustrates the sort of typical average particle composition there might be in the atmosphere. We'd go out and measure it. Starting at the top, we have the sort of primary components, things like the pink is the sea salt, yellow is the dust, uh, black represents black carbon or, or soot, essentially. Uh, Combustion sources will also emit some organic carbon. That's part of the green. So those are the primary sources of particulate matter. And then we have a, a number of secondary components of particulate matter, which again includes some organic aerosol and some inorganic aerosols such as sulfate, nitrate and ammonium. Why are particles so bad for uh, health risks? And that becomes apparent when we look at the deposition of particles into the lung. So I've got a, a schematic here of the lung uh, going down to the alveoli. So those are the air sacs right at the end of the airways inside the deepest part of the lung. So this is where the gas exchange happens. But of course, as we breathe in, we're breathing in particles and some of those particles are getting trapped within these alveoli. And the proportion of particles that get trapped relative to what we breathe in is represented by this figure here, where we've got particle size along the x-axis and deposition efficiency into the alveoli. And we can see that these smaller particles, particularly these ones less than one microns in diameter, down to a few hundred or a few tens of nanometers of diameter, actually deposit pretty efficiently into the lung. And that, of course, is the cause for concern. This is why PM2.5 is often termed the respirable fraction, because when we're respiring it deep into the lungs, a substantial proportion of that particle's load gets embedded into the lung. So how are the particles causing their toxicity? So what I have here is a, is a, a micrograph through lung tissue, 
and these beige areas of diameters sort of several tens of microns or 100 microns represent the actual air sacs and then these are the capillaries where the gas exchange happens and i've tried to draw on here to scale the size of some of these particles so we get an indication of how they scale compared to the alveoli compared to the red blood cells so this is my example of a 10 micron diameter particle my example of a two and a half micron diameter particle and even those with very acute eyesight will probably struggle to see that's a one micron particle. And the point I'm trying to make is that these small particles uh, are small compared to the size of cells. They can easily pass directly into the blood capillaries and therefore move around the rest of the body. They can pass into cells. So they can give rise just because of their size to systemic cardiovascular and neural effects. And a key point here is that out in the air, there are orders of magnitudes more numbers of these very, very small particles compared to the larger particles. So all the time we're breathing in many, many, many more of these small particles compared to the larger particles. But it's not just the size of the particles that may be important. Of course, it's the chemical composition of the particles that may be important. So as we're breathing in these particles into alveoli, as illustrated here, some of the chemical components, for example, transition metals or some organic components may undergo some chemistry when they hit components in the lung lining fluid and go through some redox reactions. And as part of that reaction sequence may release some reactive oxygen species such as hydroxyl radical. So I've illustrated that on this diagram using iron as a, an example. So iron is quite an abundant metal component in particles. We have iron-3 encountering one of the reductants in the body in the lung lining fluid, such as glutathione or ascorbate, that can reduce the iron to iron-2. That iron-2 reacts with a hydrogen peroxide molecule that oxidizes that iron-2 back to iron-3, but in doing so, it creates these reactive oxygen species. And these are very highly active species that can set off systemic inflammation pathways in the body, and indeed also create a DNA damage and perhaps be a, a source of ultimately cancer in the body as well. So let's go back to consideration of the epidemiological studies and actually look at the, how one derives some numbers associated with these. So a reminder that what we're essentially doing is just looking at regressions of exposure against health outcomes to get the gradient, which is our risk assessment. And there are two broad categories of epidemiological studies, population epidemiological studies. There are the so-called time series studies. And here one's looking for correlations in time, i.e. temporal correlations between your population health outcome, let's say mortality, and short-term variations in air pollutants. So typically it might be a daily average. And I've got an illustration of what's going on here in these diagrams. So at the bottom here, we have the daily average concentrations of particular matter in the air. We can see that they go up and down uh, quite a bit from one day to another, depending on meteorological parameters, for example. On the top here, we have uh, health outcomes, such as daily mortality in the population. And by looking at the correlation and the, and the magnitude of the regression, in principle, we can extract the response coefficient that we're after. So these sorts of epidemiological studies are essentially able to give us information about acute effects of air pollution, short-term changes leading to adverse health effects. The other broad category of uh, air pollution epidemiological studies are the so-called ecological studies, where in this time we're looking to analyze the spatial correlations between population health outcome and uh, concentration. So we're looking for populations that have got exposure in different concentrations over the long term. So typically you might look at people living in a city centre versus the suburbs or between different cities that have different average concentrations of pollutants and again looking to see whether there's an association between people living in more polluted areas and having more adverse health outcomes such as mortality. So this enables us to quantify the so-called chronic or, or long-term effects of air pollution. And the classic study in this field for air pollution from the early 1990s is the so-called Six Cities study from, from Dockery and co-workers, where they looked at air pollution levels in, in six different cities in the United States, as illustrated by these letters on the diagram, and looked at the relative risk associated with mortality 
as a function of the average pollution in each of those six cities. And as we can see, we get quite a strong linear gradient uh, from which we can infer that there is indeed an association and indeed a causal association between uh, air pollution exposure and, and mortality over the long term. So all of this is very, very simple in theory. In practice, oh, sorry, I've jumped again. Uh, just one word uh, about a, another class of uh, health studies, and that's the so-called cohort studies. In the cohort studies, you're focusing on specific individuals. So what I've been talking about previously was looking at population statistics, population exposure, population health outcomes. In a cohort study, which is a sort of gold standard in this field, you could actually recruiting individuals uh, where you can keep an eye on them. So you know much more about those individuals. You know about their exposure a bit more. You know things about their diet and whether they smoke and that sort of thing. But these are very time consuming and very complex studies to set up. Essentially in a prospective cohort, you're setting out to recruit tens of thousands of people and then you're just waiting. You're waiting for years, you're waiting for decades even to see what happens to those people. In a retrospective cohort, you may be able to piggyback onto cohorts that have already been set up by other workers, maybe for some other purpose, for example, for, for diet studies. Uh, and if you can get access to their data and you can estimate retrospectively what their air pollution might have been for those people, then you can do cohort studies retrospectively as well. But these are much more complicated, much more time consuming to, to deal with. As I was saying, these studies in principle sounds straightforward but there are plenty of issues that we need to be alert to when we try and interpret the information coming out of these epidemiological studies so i'm just going to run through some of those starting with the issue of assigning the correct exposure to start with typically in these sorts of studies you may use the nearest measurement of an air pollutant as a measure of that person's uh, exposure. That top picture there, for example, is the air pollution monitoring site in the center of Edinburgh. Or you might be able to use some sort of model, a chemical transport model or a land use regression model to try and infer some uh, more spatial patterns in the air pollution exposure as illustrated by the map down at the bottom of the diagram, which is an example air pollution map for nitrogen dioxide for Guangzhou in China, for example. But it's very difficult to validate these models. Are they correct uh, to begin with? Uh, it's also the issue that people move about. So for example, if I die, then my mortality will be associated with my residential address, but I spend a lot of my time at work and that's not where I live. So there's a misclassification there. So there are issues with exposure misclassification. And this can lead to biases in the, in the health estimate that we extract out of these epidemiological studies. Also associated with exposure is what is the relevant exposure averaging period that we might need to consider? Do we need to worry about the exposure today and looking at the mortality rates today? Do we look at the exposure period over the last two or three days, for example, and the mortality rate today? Or if we're interested in more chronic type of diseases and outcomes, do we look at the exposure over the last year, the last 10 years? And if we're considering whether air pollution has an impact on things like cancer, then we might need to be worried about lags in exposure. Does it matter what my exposure was 20 years ago, more than what my exposure was in the last couple of years, for example? And this becomes an issue as well when we're considering exposures in the neonatal field. So early newborns, they might pick up some adverse effect that doesn't manifest itself until many many years later in life so these are very complicated issues and, and essentially one has to use uh, expert judgment on the plausibility plausibility of, of disease pathways as to what is an appropriate averaging time then we have the issue of so-called confounders in epidemiological studies so a confounder is a separate covariate that uh, is also causing the outcome of interest so I've got three classic examples of confounding in air pollution studies, the first of which is weather. So extremes of weather can change air pollution levels. For example, high temperatures can lead to higher ozone levels or low temperatures can lead to stagnant air and a buildup of, of things like nitrogen dioxide and particle pollutions. But high temperatures or low temperatures themselves are, are very strong influences on 
people's health. So if we see an association between air pollution and uh, mortality, for example, it might actually be due to the high temperature or the low temperature and not to do with the air pollution that's been increased during those high, high temperature or low temperature air in, uh, time scales. Another very important confounder, particularly for long-term studies, is socioeconomic status. So poorer people tend to live in worse air pollution areas because they can't afford the housing away from the poor air pollution. And of course, poorer people tend to have poorer health for many other reasons. For example, poorer diet, or they can't afford health care, or they live in uh, cold and damper homes. So that's another classic confounding problem in air pollution studies. And then other pollutants themselves. A lot of air pollutants are strongly correlated because they come from common sources. So if we are looking to examine the effect of NO2, well, actually, what we think may be due to NO2 may be due to ultrafine particles, for example, because they're quite strongly correlated. A similar problem that we have in epidemiological studies, the so-called modifiers. So that's a covariate that changes the main variable's effect. And, and again, weather is another one of those as an example. So by modification, I mean that the influence of the air pollution is different for different levels of, say, temperature. So if we're on, in a heat wave, for example, which might have high ozone level, well, the person may be stressed already because of the high temperature, and therefore they may be more susceptible to the ozone than they would have been to that level of ozone if the temperature was lower, and, and similarly for other pollutants. Other pollutants may also have a, a synergistic effect, where if we're being exposed to mixtures of pollutants, then our susceptibility to one pollutant may be more because we're also simultaneously being exposed to a, a second pollutant. Another issue, is there a threshold concentration below which there is no effect? I've already uh, alluded to this. Can we say whether pollutants have an effect down to zero concentration or is there evidence for a threshold? This is a major determinant of the health burden and of course when we come to set air quality standards it's very relevant because if there is some sort of threshold below which there is no discernible effect then we could use that to set an air quality standard. But at present it appears that particulate matter in the air does not have a, a threshold. We have effects down to very low concentrations of PM. And it's a similar story for ozone. Although the evidence is a bit more variable, at present there's no strong evidence to suggest that there's a threshold. A final point to note is, is my study population representative? Can I extrapolate my results from one area to another area? So if I measure health effects and health risk in Edinburgh, is that appropriate for London? Is London appropriate for China? Is China appropriate for Australia? And so on. These are people that are going to be exposed to different pollutant mixes. They're going to have different lifestyles, different genetics perhaps. Um, so the issue of using health response coefficients from one study to another study is also uh, an area of issue. So what are the actual numbers? And I'm certainly not going to go through this table in any detail whatsoever but I've summarized in this table the short-term risk factors uh, associated with air pollutants. So on the left, we have a set of pollutants in the left column, particulate matter, ozone, nitrogen dioxide. We have outcomes, uh, most uh, mainly mortality outcomes for these pollutants. We have the source of these, these are expert groups like the W World Health Organization, the Committee of the Medical Effects of Air Pollutants in the UK. And the key, take home message I want from this table is not to look at the individual numbers but the sorts of values of these numbers is typically less than one percent fractions of a percent so these are the short-term risks if pollution goes up by 10 micrograms per kilometer tomorrow what is my relative risk associated with that and it's a fraction of a percent if we look at long-term annual exposure to air pollution so the same idea with this table in the left-hand column we've got uh, the pollutants PM 2.5, ozone, NO2, got different types of mortality effects here. And these values now, if we look at them, are actually quite a bit higher. So that's the key message. If we're looking at the long-term effects of air pollution, the risk factors are substantially higher than the short-term effects. So this is all well and good. These are just numbers, risk factors for populations. What does this health risk mean for me? So I'm going to take you through a couple of example calculations. 
first of all, with a short-term risk. Suppose that my risk of dying tomorrow of some cardiovascular mortality, a heart attack or a stroke, let's hope not, but suppose that risk of me dying tomorrow is about one in 100,000 or one part in 10 to the five, then if the short-term relative risk of uh, mortality is 1.4% for a 10 micrograms per cubic meter increase, i.e. if tomorrow the particulate matter I breathe in was 10 micrograms per cubic meter higher than it is today, and that risk factor is 1.4% for that 10 micrograms per cubic meter, then my risk of dying dying tomorrow rises from 1 times 10 to minus 4 to 1.014 times 10 to minus 4 at 5. So my risk rises from 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 98, 6,620. So fortunately, my risk still remains pretty small of dying tomorrow. And we could do a similar thing for the long-term risks. So these are looking at sort of annual average risks, supposing my baseline probability of dying of some cardiovascular event in the next 10 years is 1 in 25, i.e. 0.04. And suppose the long-term relative risk for cardiovascular mortality associated with exposure to PM2.5 is 9%. So that's a value that I took from the previous table. Then if I were to move tomorrow into an area where there was 10 micrograms per cubic meter higher PM2.5 than where I currently live, and I live there for the next 10 years, then my risk of dying because of that higher PM2.5 in my new place of living rises to 1.09 times 0.04, in other words, to 0.0436. It rises from 1 in 25 if I haven't moved to 1 in 23 if I do move. So if you look at the individuals, the health risks are thankfully quite small, these risk factors, but the health burden overall for society is so large because of course everyone in the population is being exposed to air pollution. So the multiplier on the population in a country is tens of millions and around the globe of course it's in the billions, so there's a very large multiplier there. One other fact I want to say as well is that this assumes I'm a population average individual. These are population studies. So due to the way they are derived, the risk estimates are the average across populations of individuals. But for any given individual, for me or for somebody else, my risk of dying is going to be different from the average perhaps. And also my susceptibility to air pollution as a cause in my death is also going to vary because of my lifestyle or my genetics. So what we have are population average statistics. And I'll come back to that right at the end. One of the early figures I showed at the start of my presentation was the attributable fraction uh, associated with air pollutions. So let's look at how that's derived. The relative risks in the tables that I have already shown you are typically quoted as per 10 micrograms per cubic meter increment in pollutant concentration. So if we have a pollutant concentration of X micrograms per cubic meter, we need to convert that uh, concentration response function into a appropriate relative risk for that actual level of air pollutant. And that's straightforward enough. So we have a concentration exposure at X micrograms per cubic meter, then the relative risk is that CRF factor to the power X over 10. So for example, if we have an all-cause all mortality concentration response function for daily mean PM 2.5 of 1.23% per 10 micrograms per cubic meter, if on a particular day, there's a PM2.5 concentration of 32 micrograms per cubic meter, then the relative risk on that particular day is 1.0123 to the power 32 over 10, or about a 4% risk. The attributable fraction of mortality is then defined as that relative risk minus one divided by relative risk. So on my example day here, the fraction of all mortality is attributable to PM2.5 on this day where the PM2.5 concentration is 32 micrograms per cubic meter. That attributable fraction is 3.8% of the mortalities we could associate with that PM2.5 concentration. And then to convert that to the actual mortality burden, as we saw in the very first figure, you multiply the attributable fraction we've just calculated by the underlying mortality rate by the population and that gives us the actual numbers of deaths and you could stratify that by things like gender or age group if you have sufficient information that enables you to do so. So we've now seen how we arrived at the WHO 
figure of 4 million premature death associated with PM2.5. They start with some estimate of the global concentration of PM2.5 to which people are being exposed in different areas around the, the world. So this will be based on measurements and, and probably satellite data and modeling data to arrive at a, a long-term annual mean PM2.5 concentration. They look at the expert judgments for the concentration response factors for different pollutant, uh, different diseases for a PM2.5. They can then calculate the percent attributable fraction associated with the different diseases for that exposure to PM2.5. And then they can multiply up by the underlying mortality rate and the population to derive the total global population burden. So we've seen going around that loop how those sorts of data are derived. I'm going to finish in the last few minutes by coming back to communicating uh, a bit more about air pollution statistics and I'm going to use the UK as an example. So I showed this uh, as one of the early slides, the uh, estimates of the number of deaths associated with air pollution in the UK specifically. We have these two expert group reports over the last few years, one from the Committee Medical Effects of Air Pollutants that uh, had a headline figure of 29,000 deaths annually and this other report from the Royal College of Physicians in the UK that reported 40,000 deaths annually. Well we can straight away get to the bottom of why there's a difference in that headline number because one report refers only to our exposure in the UK to particulate matter whereas the other report also tried to include the effects associated with exposure to NO2 as well as particulate matter and in that report buried in the detail, they attempted to allow for the possibility that there might be some double counting because NO2 concentrations and PM2.5 concentrations are quite often quite strongly correlated. There may be some issue that effects attributed to one are actually due to the other. So they tried to allow for that to give us a, a total due to PM2.5 and NO2 independently. But if we look at the exact phrasing they used, one report used attributable deaths, and we sort of looked at that. The other report uses this interesting phrase, equivalent deaths. So what's going on here? The issue is that almost entirely, these are statistically derived numbers. As illustrated, we've got uh, regressions essentially between estimates of exposure and some adverse health outcomes such as mortality. So they're just statistical associations, they're statistical numbers based on population average. And the key issue here is who is dying of air pollution? Because no one has, at least at present, air pollution recorded as a cause of death. That's the real issue. You can't look at somebody and say they died of air pollution. What people have on their death certificates, of course, are things like heart disease or respiratory disease or stroke or cancer. You don't have air pollution as a cause of death. So it's not possible easily to assign specific deaths to air pollution. But numbers of deaths is an easy statistic to grasp and it's a very emotive statistic, it's a very visceral statistic. 40,000 deaths in the UK, 4 million deaths around the world. It's a very emotive statistic. It's easy to understand. And it's particularly helpful when you want to try and compare numbers of deaths or health outcomes against other causes where it is easier to assign a specific cause to specific individuals. So, for example, for UK, cancer deaths, estimated about 140,000 people die from cancer a year or from road accidents about 1800 people die from road accidents and we can see that our number of deaths in the UK from air pollution at 40,000 is substantially higher than a road accident number but less than the cancer number so it enables us to give us a, some sort of comparative indicator of, of, of how severe a particular health burden is despite the fact that we, we can't actually say this person died of air pollution so what is really happening in these health burden estimates is that people are trying, these health professionals are trying to actually look at years of life lost. So for a ubiquitous hazard like air pollution, particularly given the fact that we can't pinpoint that somebody actually died of air pollution, 
health professionals prefer to quantify the mortality burden as years of life lost. So for the UK, that statistic is, is 340,000 years of life lost because ultimately it does make a difference whether somebody is dying at the age of 20 or even as a child because that's a huge number of years life lost compared to somebody who might already be right at the end of their life uh, uh, and of course that's any death is a sad event but if they're only losing you know a week of their life then that's not such an issue compared to to young people dying so there's an attempt to try and quantify the air pollution effects instead of direct mortalities as years of life lost so, so in that table there i've got an illustration of the data for the uk that the committee for medical effects air pollution is actually reckon it's about 340,000 years of life lost which they then say could be attributed to say 29,000 deaths based on life tables because this raises an issue I've already raised and is that is there variation in individual susceptibility to air pollution and intuitively and, and indeed the evidence suggests that yes uh, of course, one does expect there is variability in individual susceptibility to air pollution. Both acute and chronic effects are expected to be greatest for those with pre-existing disease, children and the elderly, and so on. So these are more vulnerable people compared to more healthy, uh, younger and, and middle-aged people. What COMEP tried to do is also to express the uh, shortage of life uh, for different groups of people. So they're taking that years of life lost value and saying what does that mean for certain groups of people so if we looked at the whole population age 30 then that's an average shortening of life of three days okay that's a shortening of life but it's not that big if we looked at all the people dying in a particular year that's 600,000 people in in the uk then the shortening of life is about seven months but if we look at people that we think might actually be causally being dying of air pollution this 29,000 then well on average they may be losing 11 years of their life associated with air pollution that becomes a rather more serious looking statistic and again to put that into context if we looked at the average loss of life for all people who are dying in the uk in a year due to air pollution which is seven months it's you do the same calculation for road traffic accidents it's one to three months for passive smoking it's two to three months so we can see that even for a place with uk which has got relatively clean air pollution levels uh, it's quite a substantial loss of life on average uh, due to air pollution to end on a, on a slightly more positive note uh, do we have evidence that there is actually a health improvement if we do abate air pollution yes these are the so-called intervention studies. Uh, there's one very good example uh, study, and this was done by Pope et al. Uh, in the United States in, a few years ago, where they tried to look at whether there had been gains in average life expectancy due to the decrease in particulate pollution in uh, lots of different places, lots of different urban areas around the United States. So we have on the y-axis here, the change in life expectancy versus the reduction in pm 2.5 on the x-axis and we can see a small gradient there which is corresponds to a reduction of about sorry an increase in life expectancy of about 0.6 years for every 10 micrograms per cubic meter reduction of pm 2.5 these are notoriously hard studies to do because clearly life expectancy is changing for a whole host of other reasons like better access to healthcare or better diet or cessation of smoking and so on. So they try and take this into account and still come up with this positive association that where there has been reductions in particulate pollution, there has been an increase in life expectancy. So that's a good news story. And there are other similar examples of these sorts of studies. There's a classic example in Dublin, in Ireland, um, from the early 1990s, where they introduced a coal burning ban overnight and that was a huge source of air pollution in Dublin. And then following through for several years after that ban could see that there was an increase in life expectancy and a reduction in mortality rates. But there are other examples such as introduction of low emission zones in, in London and elsewhere or, or changes in, in travel uh, associated with Beijing and, and other Olympic events. So my final slide is also to uh, be positive here uh, and show that there are substantial win-wins uh, when we're talking about air pollution, when we're also talking about climate change emissions, which of course is a, is a huge issue in our era.
there are direct win-win situations because the sources of climate change pollutants, CO2 in particular, and air pollution emissions are essentially the same, combustion, transport combustion, domestic combustion, industrial combustion for power generation and so on. So if we can have more efficient processes or we use less energy, we travel less, then we're going to reduce not just the climate change emissions, we're going to reduce the air pollution emissions as well. There's also an indirect effect as well because a lot of the climate change mitigation scenarios are trying to encourage people to live more active lifestyles, ditching the car and walking or cycling, maybe having better diets. So that will affect agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. It also affects agricultural uh, pollutant emissions. And so there's these indirect benefits of, of targeting climate change and air quality simultaneously and there's been a number of inferential studies pointing out the substantial health gains that can be in the air quality arena associated with policies that are limiting climate change emissions as well so with that i will conclude and i'm quite happy to to take any questions there may be in the remaining few minutes so thank you very much indeed Thank you very much, Professor Hugh, for this very interesting talk. And then we learned a lot about air pollutions. Um, uh, so uh, I see you just got one uh, question from Professor Evans, so who thanks you for the excellent overview of these issues. And then the question is, you identify several issues that affect interpretations of health data, such as co-founders, multipliers, representative populations, and these issues allow skeptics, such as the current US EPA administrations, uh, to re reject the science. Then how do we overcome this problem in the absence of absolute data? Well, this is always very difficult because a lot of science uh, does have some uncertainties associated with it. The, the way in, in this particular field uh, that this is handled is that there really are quite a lot of studies now from all around the world, uh, some very well designed epidemiological studies. Uh, and by periodically having these expert review groups under the auspices of, of, of organizations like the World Health Organization or the European Commission, for example, from, from my perspective here, these people, are uh, examining hundreds, perhaps thousands of papers that are publishing statistics from uh, studies all around the world. So they're looking for coherence of, of, of uh, effects, for coherence in that gradient in the response function. And in this particular field, you can go one step further because you can pool the individual studies into one great big study or several great big studies. So for example, you can pool all the European studies or indeed all the American studies, or in fact, you can pull them all together into one great big pool so that you, you get strength in numbers there. So uh, instead of having perhaps studies that are looking at populations of hundreds of thousands, you can start pooling the, the estimates that come out of studies of tens of millions of people. So these are the so-called meta-studies. Uh, so that enables you to narrow down the uh, uncertainty associated with the estimate in these regression coefficients. So it is true that individual studies may have quite large uncertainty bars, sometimes may maybe encompassing the null, but by pooling them into meta studies, you can narrow those confidence intervals and demonstrate uh, that there really is a coherent and consistent effect. Awesome, thank you very much. It is actually my question as well, and so I just want to uh, follow up with that. Um, could you please elaborate the, uh, the way we can distinguish between uh, the effect of air pollution factors and confounders? Like, for example, the example you, you're talking about the, uh, the ozone and the heat wave, for example. How could we distinguish the cause of uh, death due to heat wave or due to uh, ozone? Well, essentially, these are multiple regression models um, mm -hmm. so you're putting in all the all the your variable of interest your, your ozone for example but you also have temperature in there and then you'd also have an interaction t term for ozone versus temperature and what you're trying to hope for is that across the spread of your data set it isn't the perfect correlation that where you have high temperature is going to have high ozone where it's lower temperature you're going to have lower ozone but that there is sub uh, sufficient uh, diversity in that relationship between ozone and temperature that enables you to tease out an independent effect associated with the ozone, i.e. an independent significant coefficient in your regression mm -hmm. uh, associated with the ozone and with temperature 
and potentially also uh, an independent uh, regression coefficient associated with the interaction term, which would then tell you as well that not, not only is there an independent effect for ozone and independent effect for temperature, but that there is also this interaction or, or modification term where there is a higher susceptibility, for example, at higher temperature. So it is basically, uh, as is the case with all of these uh, epidemiological studies, it's in the numbers. You need to have as, as, as large a scale population, the larger scale and spread of exposures and spread in outcome, health outcomes. So you, you really are trying to find populations that are being exposed to low concentrations and high concentrations, whether that's in time or in space, and where you've got large enough um, numbers that you've got large enough health statistics. So things like mortality is a relatively straightforward thing to look at because you know everybody dies so there's a mortality effect if you're trying to tease out whether there are issues associated with alzheimer's dis disease for example where the prevalence it, within the population as a whole is very much smaller then you need to have very much larger populations in order to try and tease out whether there's a, a significant um, coefficient in your regression associated with that particular outcome mm -hmm. yeah perfect thank you very much we may have some time for another questions if we do have any questions from the um, audience. Um, so I may go on with my second question, please. So I, uh, it's a really interesting topic. So uh, would you believe that uh, you have said that uh, when you are or when we are, are exposed to short-term um, incident of air pollution, we, that increase the risk, but not too much. Um, and um, for, and how could we counter for it? But, uh, but we, we, we are exposed to multiples uh, even like that in our life, right? And if every time, for example, if you take your calculations of uh, risk of one over uh, one, uh, 100,000 and then we are exposed to air pollution in short term, that, decre that decreases the, the, the chance to 98,000, something like that, I believe. But we are exposed to that multiple times and it might be related to the weather, right? Like uh, in Paris, when they have every time the uh, uh, bad weather and everything is confined, and then they have to swing into the alternative circulations. So that means how? So that means uh, we, we accumulated minor events, but that could bring up into a huge event by the end. So yes, I mean that's a very important issue you raise. The extent to which, uh, if I'm exposed to a high level of ozone today, and then the air pollution is perhaps lower tomorrow. And then it's higher again the day after. Does the fact that I was exposed to high pollution the day before yesterday, is that still have a, a, a lingering effect on my susceptibility to air pollution mm -hmm. uh, in, in a day's time or, or even on consecutive days? Does the fact that I was exposed to pollutant today and the pollutant remains high tomorrow, does that have an effect? Which is why people, and of course it becomes a gray area as to at, at, at what point does a short term effect become a long-term effect so the things like particles um, clearly there is a very strong long-term effect mm. and of course a long what is a long-term effect it's a it's a whole series of short-term effects it's, it's day after day after day after day exposure so um, as as I, I said it's one of my issues it, it is trying to unravel uh, what we mean by a short-term mm -hmm. or a long-term effect and whether there is a cumulative effect or whether uh, there is not a cumulative effect. So f something like sulfur dioxide, for example, which is not an important pollutant in terms of, of ambient pollutant exposure in general, but for sulfur dioxide, it, it's generally reckoned that that is an absolute acute pollutant. If you survive an exposure one time, you know, the slate is wiped clean and you get exposed another time, um, that's completely starting again. There's no, there's no lingering or cumulative effect. But for species like NO2, ozone in particular, clearly there is a short-term effect and there's a cumulative long-term effect. And unraveling that is difficult. And, th and the way they do it in a, in a practical sense is by just looking at the averaging time that you put into a pollution model. So you, you know, it's an arbitrary averaging time, you put in a daily averaging time, you put in an annual averaging time, maybe you put in a, a free day antecedent and you just look to see what the effect is. And it's practical because at the end of the day, if you want to set an air quality standard, you need to set a, a metric and averaging time for that air quality standard. And, and it's easy to set an air quality standard associated with a daily metric. It's easy to set one associated with an annual metric. So from that practical perspective, one is sort of driving the other in that uh, you, you look at epidemiology that enables you to 
subsequently set an air quality standard metric that's easy to 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 to, to enforce like an annual average or a daily average awesome thank you very much <laughs> so i may uh, stop my question here i might send you more questions through the email later on so uh if there is no question from the audience uh we might uh uh, uh end up the presentation today and thank you very much again professor uh, hill for uh, your kind acceptance and then these very interesting lectures and thank you the audience for uh, your attendance